Alright, so we are now live and we are gonna be recording as well. All right, well, good afternoon. We're gonna get started here in just a minute. Wanted to thank you guys for joining us today. Um, see we still have some folks signing on, so I'm gonna give it just a minute. Good morning, Debbie. I see you say hi in the chat. Nice to have you join us from retirement. <laughs> Hopefully we, you could pick up something new today. All right. I know we have a tight time frame, and some of you might be using your lunch break to join us today. So we'll go ahead and get started. Um, and I wanted to first welcome you all to, this is our first webinar, um, and hopefully what will be a series of these in the future, um, presented from askajoygreen.org uh, with our friends and partners from the City of Norfolk, uh, Elizabeth River Project, Wetlands Watch, and Winhaven River Now. Um, the topic today is Rainwise Yards and Landscaping, um, and we'll be covering a few different areas. Um, and there we go. Uh, the first will be an introduction to the stormwater best management practices, and that will be presented by Justin Schaefer from the City of Norfolk. Um, we'll have BMPs for Hampton Roads, um, and that is from Barbara Duke with Linhaven River Now. We'll also have Barbara Gavin from the Elizabeth River Project presenting about living shorelines. Um, and then Shireen Hughes from Wetlands Watch will be talking about some of these best management practice assistant programs. Um, and resources that you all can take advantage of here in the Hampton Roads area. Uh, and we'll end up with some Q&A um, time so you all can submit your questions and uh, we are gonna reserve the Q&A for the end. Um, but if you could submit your questions through the chat or the Q&A feature in the webinar, that way we can capture them when you think of them and we'll be sure to um, cover them at the end of the webinar. So without further ado, I will, um, Stop sharing and I will turn it over for Justin Schaefer with the City of Norfolk. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm Justin Schaefer with City of Norfolk. I work as a project manager in our Department of Public Works Stormwater Management Program. Um, apologize, I'm not on video this morning having some computer issues, but still here, ha happy to have everybody join us today. So I was asked to give just a quick introduction to stormwater and BMPs and, and how we got to the point where we are today where we're really trying to encourage homeowners and other private property owners to do their part in managing, uh, managing stormwater. So uh, with that, we will move along here and um, give you this quick primer. So when we're thinking about, about stormwater, historically there, there's been a number of goals that have developed over time um, in, in managing it and why we want to manage stormwater. So, so first and foremost, we want to make sure that the water that's coming out of the sky from rain or snow, others should, uh, is moved away from areas that we don't want it. So we don't want it to be flooding our homes, our roads, I think. So, so the, one of the primary goals of stormwater is to reduce flooding. Um, Next would be to help to reduce erosion. So we found uh, historically that as we started to uh, move that stormwater away from our, our urbanized areas, that we were unfortunately eroding away the channels, the streams, the shorelines that we were pushing it towards. And so this image here obviously isn't from Norfolk, this is from somewhere further north. But as you, as you go north and west in the state and you get a little more topography, you'll see stream channels that start to become eroded like this, uh, where stormwater outfalls, uh, puts, puts a lot of water and rain out, and more than those channels were naturally formed to handle. The same thing can happen along the coast, 
and really just even even in say somebody's backyard just the the movement of water across that yard towards the shoreline will will start to erode things so we want to think about uh, reducing erosion due to storm water and then lastly more recently and and reasons a relative term because we've been dealing with water quality for quite a while but we've increasingly realized that a lot of the problems with our downstream waters in terms of the health of the um the, the habitats the fisheries uh, is the wildlife in general is due to various pollutants that are coming off of the land due to uh, human inputs or just from that erosion eroding away soil and, and all the um, chemicals that are attached to it. So, the, so again, a primary goal of stormwater management is to treat some of that, those pollutants to improve water quality over downstream water. So thinking about flooding, erosion, and water quality as the three major ways, uh, major goals of stormwater management. Well, then moving along. Next, we, we initially again dealt with water um, storm water by piping it putting pipes in the ground by digging ditches or channelizing old stream beds um, pouring concrete channels and, and, and finding various ways to get water off of a road or off of a parking lot off of some grass surface uh, into these ditches or pipes and then eventually down to an outfall and out in, out into a waterway where um, from the urban context, you know, it, it's it's less of a problem for us. Um, you, I always want to take this opportunity when um, when we're talking about stormwater to emphasize to folks that that in most places here in Virginia we have separate stormwater and sewer pipes. So when people think about the pipes in the ground, sometimes they get confused and think that everything is going into those and then out into the waterways. But we have separate sewer pipes that go to treatment plants and are treated but that does not mean that all the drains coming off the road in fact almost none of them go through an actual treatment plant where it's being handled so from a water quality perspective that's important to remember that while the sewage coming out of your house may be getting treated whatever goes into the drain off of your driveway or off of the roadway or parking lot is not being treated so again i always like to emphasize that when we have the opportunity to remind everyone next so so again we were, we were trying to find ways to move water and so again that started to cause problems we realized so so then over time we said all right well maybe we need to try to hold some of that water uh, we so we started to utilize large pond type features um, some like on the left just large excavated dry basins with turf grass at the bottom that could fill up with water and then slowly release it uh, up to a certain point. And then on the right, more traditionally, especially down here in the Tidewater area, you see a lot more of these wet ponds. Uh, they have a standing water table. They can create a little bit of a landscape feature, especially if you allow some vegetation to grow around the edge. But in general, their goal is to store water and to provide some level of treatment before they eventually discharge down to those same receiving channels and waters. Next. So those those practices went on for for many decades, and some other innovations occurred. Uh, you know, thinking about things like infiltration systems, French drains and dry wells have been around a long time, and some of those were scaled up um, for for bigger use. Um, starting to tie in some more biology, like I mentioned, the buffers around the edges. Um, but really, it's been in the last decade or so that we started to realize that we have in, in, an increasingly major problem. Um, particularly here along the coast, uh, we're dealing with the combined issues of increasing sea level and increasing storm frequency and intensity. And when you combine those two things, start to we've started to realize that these traditional uh, means of handling water are not going to not going to be able to keep up. Uh, we're seeing more and more problems with flooding upstream. We're seeing channels that can no longer sustain the flow. And we're increasingly seeing pollutants getting out of our control measures and into our local waterways. Um, so these things combine to to cause problems that we we thought, all right, we need to find new ways to handle this, or at least modifications. So next slide. 
when and, and this isn't this isn't a, again not a new thought but but when when scientists and engineers started to think about how can we better handle stormwater so that we can address some of these problems of increasing intensity, increasing frequency, just increasing amounts of water to handle. They started to think about um, going back to how they engineered the water in the first place. So how do we calculate how much runoff is coming off of a surface? So it used to be we just wanted to try to control that um, downstream somewhere. And then we realized, well, if we can't handle it all downstream, it's causing too many problems, then we need to try to start handling it more at the source. And so this image shows a good, a good demonstration of how more super urbanized areas, like here in Norfolk, down at the bottom right, uh, release a whole lot more stormwater, a lot more runoff. There's less getting into the ground, less being taken up by trees versus the natural area, natural forested area, like was here historically, uh, in the top left. And somewhere in between are our rural and, our, and suburban areas. You can see that there's just a trend towards increasing runoff the more green space you have, or increasing uptake and infiltration, decreasing runoff. And that's, that was the goal here, is we want less runoff of that stormwater into the streets and into our pipes. So we wanted to find ways to handle it on site. And so a lot of uh, buzzwords and terms came into play here in the last decade or so, but low impact development green infrastructure, nature-based nature, na nature -based solutions, uh, runoff reduction. And these practices have been incorporated into the various um, suggestions, engineering requirements um, at, at all levels for development as well as voluntary measures. Um, next slide. There we go. And so just, just a few graphics here as demonstration. I'm not going to go through all these. But again, the idea is that can we find a way instead of routing the water directly off site or into a big pond that only handles a certain amount of it, can we find ways across any given site, be it a large uh, church or school parking lot or a smaller home parcel, can we find ways to capture some of that water or maybe all of that water even for really more ambitious folks and to store it, um, be it above ground or to uh, store it just below the surface in some sort of a cistern type container to find ways to better infiltrate it into our soils where it can recharge the groundwater and be um, be utilized there uh, be, to be uptaken by plants and used and then eventually evapotranspirated up, up into the air. So just thinking about how can we use the, the water cycle and our soil features um, and our plant materials to better handle this water. And um, and from there, it then reduces the amount that is going to make it down to those bigger traditional features like ponds. And it's not that those features have gone away. We've continued to innovate how to use those as well through different technologies of gating and pumping based off what sort of weather is coming. Or again, installing more buffers around them to better treat the water. Um, but it allows us to to better handle upstream, to reduce the pollutants in particular upstream, and to take a little bit of the stress off of the pipe system in between so that during our bigger rain events or sudden rain events, we may not get quite as much road flooding. And from there, next slide, another important um, change over the last couple of decades, as when we started to realize that, that we were having impacts on the natural community, there, were, there was a lot of work that went into understanding what was happening. But really, um, here in recent years, there's been a lot more focus on restoration of natural features. Um, and, and that's important because it helps us to buffer some of the impacts, be it some, some of the wave action from tidally driven storms, some of the runoff where, uh, say, a vegetated buffer can filter it and slow it down, or, um, or then again, the pollutants coming out of that where these natural systems are they are able to a point to handle some of the inputs of pollutants so we want to um, we want to encourage these sort of restoration activities wherever possible and, and in a, a built out city like norfolk that can be difficult and or even an agricultural community like we have to our west um, but finding ways to balance this combination of traditional pipes and conveyances and ponds with on-site treatment and downstream restoration or even on-site restoration, really this combination has become important 
in in our fight against um, the the impacts of stormwater. And so for the rest of the presentation today, we have a lot of great organizations that are going to help uh, you to understand some of the on-site management approaches that could be useful at your home or maybe a small business. And it could be something you already have a BMP there and you don't even realize it. one of these best management practices. So it may, this will be helpful for you to identify them, to find out um, what sort of uh, maintenance is required, how you might go about improving your property, um, and what resources you, that we can bring to bear here as a region to, to help in this. Um, really, it is a regional fight. Uh, we, we are a bunch of individual cities, but the, the watershed is all the same. So it all goes the same place, and we need to protect our, our downstream water. So uh, with that, I'm going to turn it over. Thanks, Justin. Um, I know we did get a couple questions come in, but um, so that we can make sure we get through all the presentations. We are going to hold those till the end. So um, I know you'll be on on the call to help address those um, in just a little bit. Uh, so next up, I believe we have um, Barbara Duke from Linhaven River now. And Barbara, just make sure you unmute um, as you get ready to share your screen. Okay, well, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Barbara Duke, and I work for Lynn Haven River now as the manager for our sustainable yards project, which I'm going to go through with you today. Lynn Haven River now is a small nonprofit that operates exclusively within the city of Virginia Beach. So our goal is clean and healthy Virginia Beach waterways throughout the city. And we have a variety of programs and projects that help us meet this goal. This is an overall map of the watersheds within the city of Virginia Beach. It's a very large city and we have three major watersheds, the Chesapeake Bay, Atlantic Ocean, and Albemarle, Pamlico Sound, this, this area in the south drains to that. Um, but our sustainable yards program is limited to the Lynn Haven River watershed, which is in the upper right uh, with the light green color. So we have the Lynn Haven River, which has a Western branch and an Eastern branch. And then also we have Broad Bay and Lincoln Bay. And all of these water, ba water bodies drain into the Chesapeake Bay. This is a more detailed map of the Lynn Haven River watershed. And it shows the land use cover for the watershed. So there's a lot of yellow on this map and yellow represents residential land use. The 150 miles of shoreline in the Lynnhaven River watershed is almost exclusively residential and it's privately owned. So it's very hard for the city to uh, develop um, regional, regional BMPs for um, water quality in the Lynnhaven River watershed. Uh, the watershed is 21% of the city land area, but it houses over 250,000 residents. That is over half the city's population. And so this, this population density contributes to a you know, steady stream of pollution from uh, yards and parking lots. This is an aerial photo of the town center area in the Lynn Haven watershed. There's a large commercial area here as well as lots and lots of houses, um, some right on the edge of streams. We, um, the property in this area drains through the Thalia Creek into the Western Branch and out to the Bay. And there's homes lining both sides of the river here. So this area predates uh, stormwater quality regulations. So most of the runoff is piped directly to the river without any water quality treatment. So what is the Sustainable Yards Project? Well, we teamed up with the City of Virginia Beach to make the Sustainable Yards Project part of the solution to pollution. This project is funded by the city and the nutrient reductions for the homeowner BMPs that are installed through the project are recorded as part of the watershed improvement plan for the city. 
It's a voluntary program and it's a cost share opportunity for homeowners to install stormwater best management practices on their property. And we have four, um, four BMPs that we support through the program. We have what we call a per lawn plan. We can design and install a rain garden. We can design and install an infiltration trench. And we also have 125 gallon rain barrels that we deliver and install through the program. So we at Lynn Haven River now believe that you can't have the healthy river without healthy lawns. And so the Pearl Lawn Plan addresses that. The Pearl Lawn Plan has the Urban Nutrient Management Plan at its core. In addition, we work to educate and assist homeowners in other sustainable lawn care practices, such as reducing turf, planting trees and buffer areas, and introducing native plants in their landscape. All of these practices can help with uh, retaining stormwater and infiltrating stormwater onto your site so that it doesn't run off into the river. So the Urban Nutrient Management Plan, uh, the Urban Nutrient Management Plan is prepared by a Virginia certified nutrient planner in accordance with the uh, standards for residential urban nutrient management plans that are set forth by the Department of Conservation and recreation in Virginia. The plan is based on site conditions and soil samples. So I visit each site and meet with the homeowner <clears throat> to document the site conditions and take soil samples. Then I send this information to the nutrient planner and together we use that information to develop a plan that includes things like the type and amount of fertilizer, proper timing for seeding and fertilizer application, and proper mowing height and frequency. And so this urban nutrient management plan is considered the foundation for a healthy lawn. Many times there are opportunities to reduce the amount of turf on a, on a site in a yard. And so we like to use this metaphor when discussing options with homeowners. We encourage homeowners to incorporate native plants into their landscapes and we provide information and resources to help make that happen in any situation, whether it's an informal landscape, a natural setting or a more formal landscape. Homeowners are encouraged to plant as many trees as they can or at least to preserve and take care of the trees that exist in their yards. Trees have so many benefits from shade to habitat to absorption of stormwater to oxygen production. I believe trees, trees to me are a super BMP and a very important part of the Pearl Lawn Plan. The second BMP that we offer is a rain garden. And this slide shows how rain gardens are constructed. The water in a rain garden is either taken up by the plants or infil infiltrated into the soil during normal rain storms. This is a rain garden that was designed and constructed by Lynn Haven River now in 2019 in the front yard of a single family home. And the yard slopes, the yard is lower than the street. So the runoff comes from the street into this low area. We also have this driveway, which also runs off into this low area, in addition to a downspout from the roof that directs water, stormwater into this low area, which was a really muddy mess before we installed this rain garden. And um, it does handle the runoff from um, normal storms. In a heavy storm, we do have an outfall which is located here. And the water, storm water runs off through the backyard into the river from that outfall. These are um, more of the rain gardens that we've installed. And we always use native plants in our rain gardens. And I feel like in addition to the stormwater benefit for rain gardens. Uh, it really helps introduce homeowners to 
native plants and the benefits of native plants. We also install infiltration trenches. And infiltration trenches are a good fit for tight spaces or spaces where you need to preserve access. Um, also, a lot of homeowners are not, not gardeners. So, um, you know, they are more uh, interested in having um, this type of BMP in their yard that doesn't need to be uh, maintained as a garden. Um, these are stone filled trenches and usually they're about two feet in depth. Uh, Stormwater is directed into the trench and is stored in the voids of the, of the stone until it infiltrates into the natural soil underneath. And this, these two pictures, there's two different top stone treatments. Um, a lot of homeowners also will cover the infiltration trench with turf um, so that it's basically invisible in the yard. And finally, we have rain barrels. So rain barrels reduce the amount of stormwater runoff leaving the property. And it's, so it's important to empty the rain barrel after every storm and use the water. You can use the water to garden uh, for garden beds or planters, vegetable gardens. Um, I've even had some homeowners who, who've told me they use the water for uh, maintaining their fish tanks since it's not chlorinated. So there's lots of uses for the water and um, it is a potential savings on water bills in addition to the stormwater runoff benefit. So our, our Sustainable Yards project has been a success um, that we could not have accomplished without our partners at the City of Virginia Beach, Southern Branch Nursery and Bay Environmental Incorporated in addition to a lot of independent landscape contractors. We've, um, to date, the, the program started in 2018 and to date we've had 125 homeowners that have rain gardens, infiltration trenches or rain barrels installed on their properties. And we have 80 homeowners who've received a pearl lawn plan. And uh, pollution has been reduced by an estimated 40 pounds of nitrogen and three pounds of uh, phosphorus um, through this process to date. So I always like to say that together we can make a difference because I believe that the collective effort of individual homeowner actions is the key to restoring our environment in Virginia Beach. And we are looking for, forward to the future to expanding this program to our other watersheds. Thank you, Barbara. It's, um, great information, a nice overview of um, just some of the different practices that homeowners can implement to help deal with stormwater and also just beautify their landscapes. Uh, I know you guys do great work in Virginia Beach and then um, I know we have folks on the on the webinar from other parts of the region and um, Shireen is going to share with us some really great resources that can help people across Hampton Roads um, and so we'll look forward to that in a little bit um, but next up we have Barbara Gavin with Elizabeth River Project she's gonna um, talk to us about living shorelines I sure am good morning everyone thank you all for joining um, so I am Barbara Gavin. I'm River Star Homes Program Manager with the Elizabeth River Project. So I'm going to talk a bit about shoreline restoration in particular, so focusing on wetlands and riparian areas right next to the shoreline. Mm -hmm. And now we're going to advance. Okay, so if you're not familiar with the Elizabeth River Project, we are a local nonprofit working to clean up the Elizabeth. We were founded back in 1993 with the mission of restoring the Elizabeth to the highest practical level of environmental quality through partnerships. So we use a collaborative model. We don't lobby or point fingers, we partner. So whether that's with local government, homeowners, schools, businesses throughout the entire watershed, you name it, we'll, we'll work with them. Um, and the watershed really encompasses everything that you see in the picture in gold. So parts of Norfolk, Chesapeake, Portsmouth, and Virginia Beach, you might have seen on Barbara Duke's map, there's a little edge of Virginia Beach that's yellow that actually drains to the Elizabeth. And the River Star Homes program was started back in 2011. Um, we actually just hit our 6,000th River Star home. We're really excited about that. 
And it's a sustainable program where folks agree to seven things that we know improve water quality. So it's a completely free sign up. Um, and thanks to our partners, our funding partners at the cities that we work with, so Norfolk, Chesapeake, and Virginia Beach, as well as some federal funders, um, we've actually been able to do over 1,000 best management practices. So that includes rain barrels, rain gardens, living shorelines, buffers, and in particular focusing on shorelines, we've been able to do over 100. And when I talk about living shorelines today, I know that can be a term that can be kind of confusing. So we're talking about a shoreline management practice that can provide erosion control and water quality benefits at the same time. So something that will protect and restore your natural shoreline habitat and maintain your coastal processes with strategic placement of plants and stones, sand, all of that. And to give you all an idea of sort of a typical cross section of a happy, healthy living shoreline, you have a structure out front that can stop or slow down some of that wave energy that hits a site, backfill with clean sand, and then plant out a wetland grass, whether it's low marsh or high marsh natives. And then ideally it can be um, sloped to a native natural buffer area as well, instead of being cut off with a, a bulkhead or a revetment. And everyone's tidal shorelines are, are different. We see that even at neighbors' homes throughout the whole watershed. So you might have a really low elevation slope or, or change from your yard to the river, or you could have a five foot bank. Uh, you might have really calm conditions on a little creek, or you could have frequent you know, boat wake coming through consistently. Um, we also see natural shorelines that are very stable, or you could have active erosion and I'm going to give some examples of what that might look like so that you can understand where your shoreline in particular may fall. And because they're all different, the way that you stabilize it should always you know, be considered to be different. So when we're talking about living shorelines, we're looking at the left side of the screen here that has more of the greener options. So focusing on vegetation coming in with a, a sill structure. So that third photo from the left with rock or with oyster castles to slow down that wave energy, but focusing on the vegetation, helping with a lot of that versus your higher energy sites that might need something like a bulkhead or a revetment. So to give some examples of sites <clears throat> that we have done, this is a, a homeowner over in Chesapeake on Indian River, where we used that planted marsh aspect. So they had in the left, you can see a failed bulkhead that had failed years and years ago. They had very active erosion with clumps of, of grass actually falling into the river so they could actively see it washing away. They were also mowing to the water's edge, unknowingly trimming wetland grasses at the same time. So they were really also impacting their, their already active erosion at the same time. So the second photo is after six months when this project was completed. And then after a year, the wetland had already grown in substantially. And to give a, a little more information about sort of what that cross section would look like in real life. So we came in with the core log out front as a temporary stabilization method. So that core log is made out of coconut fiber that's shredded so it's biodegradable. It's a temporary measure. It was then backfilled with clean sand to get the right elevation for wetland grasses. So this one has both low marsh and high marsh and it's connected to their natural buffer as well. This also has, as you can see, goose exclusion fencing. We normally recommend people put that up for at least two growing seasons, especially at a site like this where you have a lot of curious geese. Um, that's one of the things to look at for maintenance for living shorelines because if that fencing fails, you have essentially planted a buffer for geese and ducks, or not a buffer, a buffet. Um, so you wanna make sure that these plants thrive. And, and when you also think about maintenance, you know, it's really watching these projects to understand what changes are occurring. If you're seeing any sand loss or plants dying off, maybe there's an elevation issue. It's really just watching them to see what happens. There is some need for removal of big debris that can um, dampen down your plants or a big rack buildup. Like a site like this has a ton of pine straw that hits it every, every winter. And again, on those sites where you have more substantial wave energy and you need to break down some of that before it can erode a shoreline, you can use a hardened structure out front instead of that biodegradable core log. So we often like to use 
oyster castles. And this is an example of one of those. So we put in these castles with the help of Bay Environmental, um, actually designed it for a home over on the Eastern branch of the Elizabeth River. These can be put in by hand. We did these with staff and uh, employees from Bay Environmental. You can also use volunteers. They can be put in by yourself, um, but they do take some, some work. So these ones are meant to break that wave energy out front. And then again, backfilled behind it with clean sand, this one had a pretty substantial slope. So it went from low marsh to high marsh to buffer plants within about 12 feet. And again, this is after about two years of growth. We're seeing a lot of oyster growth on those castles, which is really exciting. So they're doing that double benefit of growing oysters to improve water quality, but also breaking down that wave energy. And again, ideally you, you wanna have a site that can have a connected shoreline. You wanna have your reef with your mudflat and your tidal marsh, as well as a riparian buffer. And for example, this site is connected to this buffer. So they had a lot of active construction at this home when it was being built and a lot of stormwater runoff heading right into the river. So we came in and did a buffer planting. So this utilizes probably about 15 different native plant species, not only to frame their river view and help make it beautiful so that it's not just turf grass to the edge of their marsh, but it also slows down and filters a lot of those nutrients, the pesticides and sediment from the yard. It helps stabilize the bank behind the marsh so that you can have those deep root systems versus just turf grass to the edge. And it also provides habitat and food for critical pollinators and birds in our area. And again, we, we see the need for these, especially behind new living shorelines where it can help slow down that stormwater runoff on site. So if you have a site where you're planning a wetland restoration, think about the bank behind it. If you have a site like this homeowner in Virginia Beach where it's already a substantial slope that you don't wanna mow anyways, consider turning it into a buffer planting. And at a site like this, you know, your maintenance is watering consistently while your plants are establishing. So for your first probably two years or so, looking at any invasive species that may come in as well. And I also love the phrase, right plant, right place. You might have a shoreline where you have a stable bulkhead or a revetment that you don't need to remove to create a wetland. So perhaps instead you look at behind your bulkhead in your yard, is there space for you to convert to wetland grasses. At a site like this, they actually already had wetland grasses mowing. So all they had to do was create a no mow zone and they just look at it every year to see if they need to increase the area that they don't mow. And just like Barbara said, we want people to use native plants whenever possible. There's a lot of great resources locally. If you're in Hampton Roads, there's two local native plant nurseries that I can think of off the top of my head, Southern Branch Nursery, and Lady Fern's Native Plants in Norfolk. There's also this great guide online. And then I do wanna just briefly mention that shorelines are regulated. So you wanna keep that in mind if you're looking to do a wetland restoration or an oyster reef, you want to go through a permitting process. So there are steps that you need to go through. Organizations like ours can help you get through that process. There's also a lot of great contractors that can help as well. And I will save questions for afterwards. Thank you. Thanks, Barbara. Um, so I think we're right on schedule. And next up, we have Shireen Hughes with Wetland Watch. I'll turn it over to you. And um, yep. need to unmute, unmute myself. <laughs> okay. Well, hi, everybody. I'm Shireen Hughes. I'm the Assistant Director of Wetlands Watch. It's a nonprofit located in Norfolk, Virginia. But I'm also the Virginia coordinator for the Chesapeake Bay Landscape Professional Certification Program. So uh, we had some questions in the chat about who can I get to do the work on my property and who, who is qualified to do these sustainable landscaping practices and these stormwater practices and these living shorelines. And so uh, about in 2014, Wetlands Watch joined forces with several other organizations, including the Chesapeake Conservation Landscaping Council. And we developed a training and certification program. 
It was originally designed just for landscape professionals. So that's why it has the name Chesapeake Bay Landscape Professional, but uh, stormwater practices and shoreline practices um, uh, require kind of a cross sector and a cross training of professionals. So we have engineers, we have uh, environmental professionals, and we have landscape professionals um, and arborists, for instance, that have been trained through our program. And some people work for local government, some people work for nonprofits, and some people work for the private sector. We have an online website and uh, a database that you can search by zip code to find the professionals uh, that you know, are qualified and have been trained. And what I would like to say is when you get into uh, designing rain gardens, for, in for instance, um, we actually have two levels of certification. We have uh, level one, which is basically sharing a common core knowledge about sustainable landscaping practices, watershed health, and stormwater practices. And then we have level two designers and installers, and they've gone through an extra rigorous training and evaluation process um, to learn how to design and install those smaller scale residential practices like rain gardens, permeable pavement. Uh, and we're developing in the middle, we're in the middle of a piloting a buffer certificate program and we'll be developing a living shoreline training program as well. So I just wanted to let you know, you can go online to our website and you can find a, a, a pro near you. So, and also you can contact me. Um, so there's a lot of nonprofits in the area. You've heard from Lynn Haven River now and the Elizabeth River Project. Uh, the James River Association also has um, uh, advisors and actually Almost all the nonprofits in the area have certified CBLPs on staff as well. So they can provide technical advice to you and they have a lot of experience. Um, or you can hire a certified pro, as I said. So the James River pro, uh, program covers the entire James River watershed. They have a River Hero Homes program, but right now they have a cost share program for living shorelines. And Chesapeake Bay Foundation is working with the city of Hampton um, and they do living shoreline projects as well as um, rain gardens, et cetera, in um, often and often will have some cost share arrangements. Um, I've included some other organizations because they may be able to find technical advice for you, or they may offer some uh, trainings and workshops that you might want to go to. For instance, Landscapes for Life is a program to train pro property owners on sustainable landscaping practices, and you could kind of self-educate, and Lynn Haven River Now ran that online recently. Uh, Norfolk Botanical Garden often has um, some uh, classes as well. Uh, the Soil and Water Conservation Districts have a program called the Virginia Conservation Assistance Program. And they get funding every year um, to, to work with property owners to implement all these different practices. And they, have, they can provide 75% of the cost of some of the practices. So um, if you don't live in an area that has a cost share program with a watershed group, you may have a cost share program available through the conservation assistance program. And uh, for instance, in James City County, um, the Col Colonial Soil and Water Conservation District works with all these counties and they have uh, funding for rain gardens and living shorelines, et cetera. Plus they provide technical advice. So uh, don't despair if you don't live in the watershed of some of the uh, speakers. Uh, the city of Norfolk has tons of programs. Uh, one is called Retain Your Rain and they're actually coming out with a new um, manual that kind of 
provides you with guidance on the design, installation, and maintenance practices of these different stormwater practices. They also have a stormwater reduction fee program for uh, citizens that implement some of the stormwater practices we've been talking about. Uh, uh, CBF, Chesapeake Bay Foundation in Hampton started a resilient and innovative neighbor program. Uh, it's in one particular watershed that they're piloting right now, and they are providing some cost share or technical advice or technical assistance with rain gardens, tree plantings, maybe permeable pavement. And then Baystar Homes, if you register to become a Baystar Homes, which I'm assuming a lot of you are involved in that. They kind of connect you with other localities and their programs. Uh, James City County uh, works with the Soil and Water Conservation District to do this Clean Water Heritage Program. And they have a number of uh, cost share incentives for lawn care and rain gardens, et cetera. There is now a new Living Shoreline Collaborative within the Hampton Roads area that is we're all a whole bunch of groups working together, all the different uh, localities and watershed groups that I just showed you in the last two um, slides are included in this Living Shoreline Collaborative. And it's through this collaborative and some funding that I'll be working with all these partners to develop training for Living Shoreline professionals. Um, and they all have their um, websites and there's tons of information if you're interested in living shorelines. Uh, the Chesapeake Bay Foundation has a listserv and they actually have a link to different contractors that are starting to want to promote themselves as being living shoreline professionals. And then there's other advisors, um, the Cooperative Extension. Within the co Cooperative Extension, there are the Master Gardener programs and the Mass Advanced Water stewards and the tree stewards have advanced training. The water stewards have been trained about these stormwater practices. So they often can be provide you with technical advice and some of them will come out and take uh, soil samples for you, et cetera. Um, the Center for Coastal Resources Management, which is under the Virginia Institute of Marine Science and DCRs, SEAS program, Shoreline Erosion Advisory Service, will come out and provide you with free advice about shoreline erosion problems and whether a living shoreline is appropriate for your site. Virginia Department of Forestry has information. They'll come out and talk to you about riparian buffers. Um, those riparian buffers, as uh, Barbara showed you, are regulated. So, you know, they're called the Chesapeake Bay Protection Area or Resource Protection Area. They're usually 50 to 100 feet. If you live along a waterway, you may have part of your yard in a resource protection area and you really should not be cutting down trees. You should be protecting the vegetation and enhancing those areas. Uh, the Department of used to be called Game and Inland Fisheries, and now it's called Wildlife Resources, has this program called Habitat Partners, and they provide all kinds of advice as well. I want to draw your attention to askhrgreen.org. They've got a lot of great links to resources. And when I talked about um, the Chesapeake Bay Preservation Act and that riparian buffer, you can go to the website on you click on yard and landscapes and then on the living living on the water and you can find out by typing in your address whether you have uh, you'll be taken to a map and it'll show you whether you have that resource protection area or the Chesapeake Bay preservation area on your property. Uh, another one is uh, yard and landscaping, good to know and do topics, and that will uh, link out to some of the native plant resources. I actually included some of the native plant sources in this area as well, because all of these, as you heard Bar both the Barbaras say, <laughs> um, these are all native, uh, using native plants. And so you know, all the practices, rain gardens, buffers, uh, living shorelines, um, 
conservation landscaping, they're all using native plants. And, and so the next question is, uh, besides which plants should I use, is where do I find them? So I just wanted to let you know that these are different resources for finding them. And then I am trying to get more and more landscape contractors in the Hampton Roads area trained and certified. And we're providing funding for them to do that. And I, and I would love to have you help me get the word out. If people register to go through our training um, and it's majority of it is online now with one day in the field in Norfolk. If they register before the 30th of this month, they get $50 off the registration fee. And then I'm providing scholarships that take an additional $145 off the registration fee. So send them my way. And I want people, more people certified so that when you ask me a question, Q and A, I can say, I know exactly who, I mean, you have a choice of multiple people to do the work. So, um, and I would like to say that Barbara Gavin and, and Barbara Duke are both CBLP certified. Barbara Duke just got her level two certification and uh, Justin helps me run the trainings all the time. So we're all involved in this because we all felt like we needed more landscape contractors that you could call on to help you get this work done. So um, let's see, there's some questions in the chat and the Q&A. Uh, will the Lynn Haven River now rain garden and infiltration trenches be available again? Uh, Barbara's going to answer that. That's great. Um, let's see. Will the slides be available? Yes. Justin, I know at the very beginning of this presentation, somebody had a question for you about stopping runoff from 64. Is there anything you can do to help the homeowners from ending that flooding? And I wanted Vicki to know that I, you may be in the Elizabeth River watershed and uh, you should contact Bar Barbara Gavin because you could become a River Star home and get all kinds of great advice because Barbara and also Casey who did the, that buffer design for that living shoreline, uh, they're both CBLP certified and they both know their stuff. Are there any other questions? I'll stop sharing mine. Thanks, Shireen. Great information, great resources. We will definitely, just to address that one question, We'll send out a link um, to download the presentations um, after this webinar concludes today. And also we'll be posting this recording on our YouTube page. So we'll send out a link to that as well. Um, it's a lot of information in a short time period. So, and uh, please feel free to share those resources um, as widely as you can. We'd love to help get the word out to more folks. Um, Justin, did you want to um, address the question about the, I think it was the neighborhood that floods, particularly after heavy rains, they live close to the interstate, um, anything they can do, anything the city can help them with. Uh, I'm not sure what city that, that yeah. pertains to. Sure, yeah. It, so VDOT, um, VDOT owns some of their outfalls that, that come off of the interstate, obviously. And depending on the location in the city and what sort of agreements are in place, they may or may not own the eventual downstream conveyance where it drains out into a lake or a river or the bay, wherever it may be. So I would encourage you, um, if you're having this issue around VDOT, um, to reach out to the city you live in. If it's Norfolk, you're welcome to reach out to me directly. And to um, ask somebody from their stormwater management group um, to come to the site and take a look at it with you. Um, that's going to be the best way. I, I've done this recently with a homeowner. We're trying to get resolved through VDOT because they do own the outfall. There's other situations where the city owns the outfall, and it's really just a case-by-case -case situation. So, so please reach out um, to myself or to your local city and um, try to get you some help on that. And if you don't know who to contact, call me, and I'll find somebody in another city for you. 
Um, I just saw another question come in from speaking of contractors, are there places to, are there go to places to find permeable paving installation for driveways, specifically in Norfolk and planning a landscape design, how to incorporate that into the overall plan. Anyone want to tackle that one? Uh, I would say if you're in Norfolk, my suggestion is always contact ERP first like Barbara Gavin, <laughs> make it because there might be a cost share benefit to you installing permeable um, paving. And they may have some specific contractors that they like to work with. Um, I have, you know, a knowledge of, like I said, CBLP certified contractors that have the knowledge and expertise to do that. Um, there are probably only about 17 independent contractors in the Hampton Roads area. And some of them are designers, but they may have uh, contractors that they work with as well. Um, yeah, the first one that comes to mind just off the top of my head is Dominion Pavers or Terra Firma. So I can also write those in the chat, but you can Google either one of those. It's possible that Southern Branch does permeable pavement, I'm not sure because um, they have a full service landscaping business. And we have, um, I'm not sure which contracting company he works for, uh, Dave Chewy, who is a level two certified um, CBLP, and you can find him on our, in our database. He now works for a full service contractor as well. I'll type his name in to the chat. And Barbara, Duke, there was a question for you as well that Shereen mentioned earlier about when the assistance programs would be available again through Lens Even Over Now. Yes, well, we do have a limited number of practices that we can install um, per contract year. So we are going to open up that um, application in September, October this year. We're running right up on schedule. I think we were supposed to end around one. We certainly could take a, any more questions if you all have them and try to answer them. You can always send us, um, I share my screen really quick with our email address. Um, you can always send us questions to hrgreen at hrpdcva.gov. Um, and we will certainly do our best to put you in contact with, um, I mean, I can post, we'll post this in the chat as well, but in contact with um, someone locally that could help you. That's kind of um, what we do best is, is gather um, our local experts like we've had today on this webinar um, and put you in touch with them um, to help discuss whatever local issues or questions you might have. Um, some of you are probably uh, members already of the Base Star Homes program, and we'd love if you're not for you all to sign up uh, and just an opportunity for you to hear more about um, helpful information, webinars such as this, and um, just different things that our local partners are doing um, that will help uh, you and your efforts to live a little greener. And um, we will be posting this webinar on our YouTube page. Um, later today, and uh, we'll send it out to all of our attendees, as well as the links to download the presentation so you all can have them for further use and viewing. So um, I'm going to thank our panelists today for your time and the valuable information that you shared and all the work that you do on a regular basis. Um, we're so glad that we got to hear from you today and um, really appreciate you taking the time to share a little bit with our audience and look forward to doing more of this in the future. Glad to help out. Thanks for inviting us. Hmm. All right, well, hope you all have a great Monday, have a great week, um, and we'll be in touch via email to follow up with all the materials from today. Awesome, thanks y'all, thanks Rebecca.